Good afternoon, barely. Welcome to the Cato Institute, or to the Cato Institute in exile anyway. Um, we are delighted to see so many of you here on such a dismal day. I assume there are some more people trying to struggle through the rain, but we're glad to have all of you, and we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, some of you may, have know, may know that we've recently started a new website at Cato called libertarianism.org. You can get your brand new libertarianism.org um, bookmark out on the table out there. One of the sections in libertarianism.org is called Major Libertarian Thinkers. We may have to change that name as we've had a few inquiries from people as to why they're not considered major libertarian thinkers. So. We may have to come up with a broader term, but our speaker today, David Friedman, just might be the youngest person to become known as a major libertarian thinker. Uh, by my calculations, he was only 22 when he started writing a column for New Guard magazine back in the 60s titled The Radical. And I think that when I joined Young Americans for Freedom, which published New Guard in 1970 or so, I saw some of those columns, uh, and they helped to push me in the libertarian direction before the column ended. But in 1973, he published a book called The Machinery of Freedom, which was one of the most important books of the emerging libertarian movement. It was a lively book advocating anarcho-capitalism from one of the most important publishers in America. So it really got a lot of attention. Since then, he's gone on to write such books as Hidden Order, The Economics of Everyday Life, Law's Order, What Economics Has to Do with Law and Why It Matters, Future Imperfect, Technology and Freedom in an Uncertain World. He's also written, I think, two novels. Uh, many of his writings are on his own website, and you can see a lot of them there, although you really should go ahead and buy them. Hidden Order was published in 1996, and it was one of the first books to explain economic reasoning and policy in non-technical language for a popular audience. And that's a field that's really boomed in the years since then. You've had books by Stephen Landsberg and Stephen Levitt, uh, Tyler Cowen, lots of people writing these books that apply economic reasoning to issues and popular topics and hopefully have actually spread economic understanding. David wrote two studies for Cato more than 25 years apart. We should probably try to do that more frequently. Uh, but he wrote one in 1982 on better monetary systems and a second one just last year, which we do have copies of available out on the table on how free market principles could produce a better system of legal defense for the indigent. We're pleased that this year he is a member of the International Selection Committee for the Milton Friedman Prize. I urge you all to make nominations for the Milton Friedman Prize and the uh, prize will be awarded next May 4th at a dinner. And uh, keep an eye on libertarianism.org because we have a number of old David Friedman lectures from the 1970s and 1980s that we've uncovered uh, videotapes of and we will be posting them there along with uh, videos of Friedman Hayek, uh, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, Murray Rothbard, lots of other libertarian speakers that we are digitizing and posting um, over the next few months. Currently, David Friedman teaches in the School of Law at Santa Clara University in California. He's visiting this semester at George Mason University, which he calls the best and most interesting, not yet famous economics department in the United States. I know that we have a lot of friends who are working to make it not just interesting, but famous. Uh, we're delighted that they have him out here for a semester and that we're able to have him here at Cato. So please welcome David Friedman. suggested earlier to David that perhaps if Cato were a little kinder to the religious conservatives, you could get them to talk to their boss about providing better weather for events like this. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, about 40 years ago, I wrote Machinery of Freedom, uh, and one part of it, part three, sketched out what a society with private property but without government might look like and how it could function, and argued in favor of such a society. Uh, 
What I would like to do today is to first give a very brief sketch of what those institutions uh, would look like and what I think the results would be. Uh, and then go on to expand those ideas in three different directions. Uh, one of the things I want to do is a more precise explanation of the economics of that market, of what reason one does or does not have to think that a market for law would actually produce good law. Uh, second is to discuss the reasons it wouldn't. That is to discuss the particular forms of market failure that one would predictably get on a market for law because like any market, it is less than perfect even if better than alternatives. And then I would like to go to discussing an issue that was raised by Jim Buchanan in the one good review that book ever got, where I define a good review as a review that makes the author think. And Jim raised a very important problem with the argument I had given. I have been thinking about it ever since, and that was a long time ago. And I think not only that uh, I have more or less an answer to his problem, but also that thinking about it, uh, it turns out to be relevant to an issue I raised in the original book, which had to do with whether the system was stable or not. So I will try to go through all those things. Uh, let me start by sketching the, the system. I assume there are probably people in this room who, alas, have not read The Machinery of Freedom. Uh, and so let me describe what I was imagining. And that is you have a society where there is no government and where rights are protected by private firms. So that essentially everybody is the customer of one of a large number of private rights enforcement agencies. Uh, he pays them an annual fee in exchange for which they both protect his rights and arrange to settle disputes he has with other people. So they're providing either the equivalent of police and courts or at least access to the equivalent of police and courts. And the obvious problem with, which a, with such a system, as everybody immediately sees, is what happens when I claim that you violated my rights, I claim you stole my television set, you claim you didn't, my rights enforcement agency wants to use force to make you give the television set back and maybe compensate me, your rights enforcement agency wants to defend its customer, the two agencies get into a fight, doesn't that show the system doesn't work? And my view is no. That's an unlikely outcome of that system, that what actually happens is that because my agency and your agency realize that there will sometimes be conflicts between their customers, and they realize that having their employees shoot at each other becomes very expensive pretty quickly, not just the bullets, but the uh, risk pay. Uh, therefore, each pair of such agencies have an incentive to contract in advance on a private court, an arbitration agency, and agree to accept its settlement of disputes between them. And what enforces that contract, given that there is no government up there to enforce contracts? The answer is that it's enforced by what we like to refer to as the discipline of constant dealings. The fact that if my agency refuses to abide by the arbitrator's verdict when it goes against them, then your agency will not agree to go by that verdict when it goes the other way, and then we'll both be back shooting at each other, and then we'll lose customers to other agencies that have a more responsible attitude to, to the product they're producing. So then what I predict uh, in such a system is you will have a network of agreements such that every pair of agencies have agreed on a court. The courts then have an incentive to generate legal systems that agencies will, choose, will make them choose that court. And since the agencies are really middlemen, what they're ultimately doing is selling the legal system to their customers, because if I'm a customer of that agency, I'll be under that arbitration agency's legal system. The arbitration agencies have an incentive to design law that people will want to live under. Uh, and that was sort of the basic argument. And I sketched out a hypothetical case uh, where you can imagine that the customers of one agency are in favor of capital punishment, the customers of the other agency are against it. And what happens, as I imagine it, the, each agency calculates how much it's worth to its customers to get their way. So that agency one says, how much more could we charge our customers for our services if we could guarantee them that anybody who killed them and was convicted would get executed? And agency two say, asks, how much more could we ch charge our customers if we could guarantee them that if they are convicted of murder, they won't be executed. If somebody is convicted of murdering them, he won't be executed. If 
the pro-capital punishment agency is willing, values its rule more than the anti, then the bargaining between the two produces a pro-capital punishment rule if the other way an anti, so you thus get loosely speaking legal rules that maximize economic efficiency, where any change in the legal rule that produces larger benefits to the gains than losers, losses to the, to the losers will end up with appropriate side payments being negotiated. That was the basic argument as I sketched it out, and I pointed out that unlike a political system, people are actually in a position to make reasonably well-informed judgments because instead of comparing the actual uh, Obama rule of four years with the hypothetical McCain rule of four years, you get to say, all right, well, my neighbor is a customer of agency A, I'm a customer of agency B, my neighbor seems to get better protected, his legal cases are handled more smoothly, I think the rules he, he is under work well, so I'll switch, switch agencies. So that you have something closer to buying ordinary products on the market where purchasers are well informed, uh, they're well informed both because they can compare the alternatives and because their choice matters. How you vote has almost no effect on what will happen to you, whereas what seller or product you buy from has a large effect on what product you end up with. So that's the basic original, original argument. And I made a couple of claims in that. Uh, one of them was that you would get economically efficient rules. And another was that whether or not the system of state was stable would depend on economies of scale in the enforcement industry. That if you ended up with only two or three large firms that were doing the job of enforcing rights, there would be a temptation for those firms to cartelize, for those firms to conclude that robbery was more profitable than producing the service and turn themselves into a government. Uh, and on the other hand, if you imagine an equilibrium with 100 or 1,000 such agencies, now if my agency decides that it's going to collect taxes instead of selling its services, I can track with someone else to protect me from them, uh, and therefore they find it's not worth their while to do that. So the argument is that stability depends on a firm that's 1% of the market being able to compete successfully with a firm that is 40% of the market as in many other, uh, other economic contexts, that you not have natural monopoly or anything close to it. And I offered some reasons to suspect, though obviously one doesn't know, that that condition would be met, that you would have quite a large number of firms. Uh, Jim Buchanan's uh, review uh, raised the point that there were really two halves to that market, and I'd only thought of one half. The half I thought about was allocation, that is, that you will get capital punishment between these two groups of people if and only if it's worth more to one group than to the other. And Jim says, yes, but what determines whether the pro-capital punishment people have to pay the anti to get their rule or the anti have to pay the pro to get their rule? What's the default option, as it were? Or to put it differently, what is the allocation, what is the distributional consequence of this market? Uh, what people have in effect, start out with what rights that they can then sell to others. And that was a legitimate point that I hadn't really thought about and was worth thinking. Let me now, as I say, do three things. I want to explain a little more carefully the economics of this market. I want to discuss where it will have pro predictable problems. And then I want to go back and try to answer Jim's, an Jim's question and to show that the answer to that question is actually relevant to my initial discussion of stability which I hadn't realized at the time. Okay. Let's think about the market for a minute. And the market I want to think about is what I refer to as the market for legal assent, the market on which the legal rules between any pair of people are being determined through the middleman, of course, of the arbitration agencies and the, and the uh, rights enforcement agencies. Uh, but you could abstract away from that, just as you can imagine a Robinson Crusoe primitive economy, you can say, well, imagine the individuals are bargaining with each other and you and I have to agree on the legal rules between us and we can make side payments and so forth. And at first glance, you might say, well, that's a competitive market. Look, there are 8 billion people out there for me to get agreement with or maybe 300 million if we limit it to the current territory of the U.S. Competitive markets for ordinary economic reasons give efficient outcomes. We're home free. But that's wrong because it is not a competitive market. 
with 300 me million people out there, it is roughly 10 to the 17th bilateral monopolies. Because if you think about the logic of that market, on an ordinary competitive market, if you don't sell me wheat, I just buy more, more wheat from him. But if you refuse to sell me legal assent, if you refuse to agree on the rules between us, buying two legal assents from him doesn't solve the problem. I need agreement with everybody. So therefore, what you really have is not a competitive market, which is what it looks like at first glance, but rather a huge number of bilateral monopoly bargains uh, between people agreeing on legal rules. And that means for the economists in the room that I'm really relying more on Coase than on Marshall. And that the argument for efficiency is the argument that says that if transaction costs aren't too high, individuals, even in bilateral monopoly, although they will disagree about who pays whom what, will tend to bargain to an efficient outcome because they both benefit by doing that. <coughs> so that's, that's the sort of thinking more clearly about my argument and seeing <coughs> some limitations. <coughs> Second issue is where would you expect market failure? on that market. Let me m go back a step and define market failure because one of the problems in economics and many other fields is that we have technical terms that sound self-explanatory and aren't. Uh, I expect that the world is full of people who think they understand the theory of relativity except for the mathematical fine points. The theory of relativity, that says everything is relative. I understand that. But of course, the theory of relativity doesn't say that everything is relative. And saying that is indication that you don't understand it. Similarly, market failure sounds as though it means markets failing. That isn't what it means. That a market could fail in the sense of giving a bad outcome for reasons having nothing to do with market failure. And market failure exists in many contexts that we don't usually describe as markets. And market failure, for my purposes, and I think the right way of defining it, describes any situation where individual rationality does not lead to group rationality. So that economists normally assume that individuals are rational. You are tempted to say, well, that solves all the world's problems. Individuals are rational. You'll always do the right thing. And then you work out things of which the toy example that probably you all, all, all of you are familiar with is the prisoner's dilemma, where both prisoners are rational, and yet they end up with a worse outcome for them than if they had both done something. And if you think through the logic of externalities, of public goods, of adverse selection, all the standard examples, you realize that each of these has the characteristic that because of the nature of the game you're playing, as it were, even if the players are rational, they may not get the right answer. They may get an answer worse for all of them than some other alternative answer. Now, people who want more detail on that, um, I've been webbing mostly audios of various talks I've given over the last uh, couple of years on my web page. That includes at least one on market failure, probably several. And you can go up on my web page, click on the links for my talks. You don't even have to wait for something to be digitized and hear it. But I just wanted to make the point of what market failure is. Now let's think about the market for legal assent and imagine a case where the legal rule between me and you affects him and we are all customers of different agencies. You and I, or the agencies bargaining for us, will take account of the effects on their customers. But there's no good reason for them to take account of the effects on customers of other agencies. And my standard example for this is intellectual property. Let us suppose we are bargaining on whether he will respect my copyrights. What are the benefits and costs of that bargain? Uh, if he respects my copyrights, he has to pay me licensing fees to use my intellectual property. That's a cost to him, a benefit to me. Those, those cancel, those wash out on net. It's neither a gain nor a loss. Second, if he has to pay me uh, licensing fees to use my intellectual property, he sometimes won't use it because its value to him is positive but less than the licensing fee. That's what economists refer to as the deadweight cost of intellectual property that the optimal use of intellectual property is to treat it as if its cost was zero, because although producing it is costly, one more person reading the book doesn't cost me anything at all. Uh, but if we have a charge for books because of copyright law, a charge beyond the cost of the paper, then people will sometimes not consume it, even though it's worth something to them. So that's a deadweight cost. 
What's the benefit? There's also some additional costs. We have to enforce copyright law. Uh, we have to have some lawyers and some trials and some people spying on him to see whether he's reading my book or however we're going to enforce it. So those are costs. What's the benefit? The benefit is I have an incentive to produce more intellectual property if I can get paid by producing it. If total benefits are greater than total costs, then an economic legal system would have intellectual property. If they are less than total costs, it won't. I am offering no opinion on which case occurs. But what I want to point out is that if you should have legal, have intellectual property, you may not have it in my system. Because my system leaves out the benefit to third parties of my producing more intellectual property. All right. One of the benefits is that when he agrees to pay me for my intellectual property, you get to read more of my wonderful books because I write more of my wonderful books. But since you're a customer of a different agency than he and I, our agencies and their bargaining ignore benefits to you. Consequently, they underestimate the next benefit, the net benefit, and therefore sometimes, not always, but sometimes you won't get intellectual property law even though you should, or you'll get intellectual property law that is weaker than the optimal level of protection would be. That's the basic argument. And it may occur to some of you that that's only one example. This also implies that you will undersupply environmental protection where the environmental effects are widespread. So that, for example, it is very unlikely that under my system you will have rules to prevent global warming, even if you should. I'm not sure you should, but suppose you should. Suppose there is some environmental effect where if we all did less of X, we'd all be better off. Uh, producing, burning coal in London in the late 19th century, producing fog, something like that. In that case, uh, since the benefit of the two of us having agencies that have agreed to this particular restriction is a benefit that uh, is some of which goes to you. Our agencies ignore that, so you will have a lower level of environmental protection than would be optimal. Uh, now, none of these things, in my view, imply that we're better off with the government, because what I'm really saying is that with the private market for law, we have a tendency to produce economically efficient law, but it's not a perfect tendency. There are certain predictable ways in which it will fail, just as the same is true for other private markets. On the other hand, for the political market for law, I don't think there is any good argument for expecting to produce efficient law, or at least only if you assume a zero transaction world, which is not, not very likely. So I still think that this leaves the system I'm arguing for as less bad than the available alternatives, but I also think you have to be realistic about seeing what, where it will fail, where it will come short of, of perfection, so to speak. Uh, so that's the, my second point is that kind of, of market failure. I should also have mentioned, because it's sort of in between my first and second point, and again, really for the benefit especially of economists in the room, that because that, that the, the implication in my market system of this sort of multiple bilateral monopoly structure is that the individual enforcement agencies are only going to be caring about the values of their marginal customers. All right, this is essentially like monopolistic competition for the economists who are familiar with the idea. So, for example, I use Apple computers. If Apple raises their prices by 5%, I'll still use Apple computers. That means that if Apple is making design decisions about their computers, they can ignore me. What they are interested in is changing the design in ways that will make the people willing to pay more who aren't willing to pay more now. The reason I get the great deal of getting my lovely little MacBook Air for a very reasonable price is that if they charged more, other people wouldn't buy it. All right. So that means they don't really have to worry about me very much in designing it which may explain why they've never bothered to put in a separate coprocessor for graphics in that machine, maybe next year. Uh, and uh, they have to look at sort of their marginal, their marginal customers. Uh, similarly, in this case, if I really care a huge amount about death penalty, either direction, doesn't matter, they aren't going to count that huge amount because they can't do perfect discriminatory pricing. They can't go to me and say, just for you, our price is $300 higher. Uh, they've got to ask for what for the marginal customer is the value of this feature. If they give a feature that the marginal customer values at $10, they can raise their prices by $10. So that's another respect in which it falls short of perfect economic efficiency for predictable, straightforward economic reasons. Let me now go on to what's maybe the more interesting question, and that's Jim's original 
uh, comment or original problem uh, about the distributional logic of this system. So the question is, when these rights enforcement agencies are bargaining, what is the starting point they are bargaining from? Uh, what is the default rule, which both of them assume they will have if they can't reach an agreement? And therefore, which side in a disagreement has to pay to get its way, has to give a side payment to the other to get its way? And the way I think it is useful to think about this case we want to start out by saying, what happens if there's no agreement? If there's no agreement, there's violence. Violence is worse for both, but it's a bilateral monopoly, and I can try to use the threat of violent breakdown to get you to agree to my rule without a side payment. You can try to use the threat of violent breakdown to get me to agree to your rule without a side payment. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about that kind of game. Uh, there are a lot of games of that sort. Uh, if you think about border disputes among countries, uh, about uh, union management, where it's not violent disagreement but a strike, where both sides are better off without a strike, but one of them would like to be without a strike with a higher wage than the other would like to be. There are a lot of conflicts of that sort that you observe. And I think what you observe in most of them is there's a great deal of inertia. That you don't observe that every time a country uh, raises its military budget or launches a new battleship, the border moves half a mile in the direction of the other country, uh, and similarly for other such, other such conflicts. So what that suggests to me is that once there is a starting point, that once they have bo somehow bargaining or some other way gotten to a set of rules, that will then become the baseline they'll bargain from because uh, nobody wants to get involved in violent conflict and trying to disturb, in effect, the status quo is a shelling point for those of you who are familiar with with shelling points. That's one way of, of, of thinking about it. So where, does the, where do the starting rules come from? They're really coming out of a mutual threat game. That in effect, each agency is saying to all the other agencies, if we do get violence, what will happen? Uh, if we'll do a good job of killing your people and you'll do a bad job of killing our people, then maybe you ought to agree to something closer to what we want instead of what you want. And that once that mutual threat game has been played out, you then have some set of rules and you then bargain from that. And I think this to some extent describes not just my world, but the real world as well. That if you think about uh, questions either between countries or within countries, I was in fact reminded of it by what's been going on with the demonstrations uh, recently, that there's a sense in which underlying in every society, you see it much more clearly in places like Egypt at the moment or, uh, or Tunisia, underlying every society is the idea if people really don't like the rules enough, they'll start shooting at each other. They'll start engaging in some sort of violent conflict and therefore somehow each functional peaceful society has worked out a solution to that mutual threat game where probably everything else being equal, uh, the people in a better position to threaten probably end up with somewhat more favorable terms in the starting point than the people in a worth, worse position, position to threaten. Uh, well, if you look at it this way, you then m realize that each enforcement agency in my model is really producing two different products. One of them is the product of rights enforcement, which is what it's selling to its customers. But the other one is the product of being able to make believable threats to other agencies. So that on the one hand, for the job I'm selling to my customers, what matters is how well can I keep their rights from being violated, at how low a cost can I arbitrate their disputes, how happy they are with the results, and so forth. But there are those three tanks in the back room. And why are there three tanks in the back room? Because if things ever broke down, we want to be able to make it clear to our competitors, to the other agencies, that we could fight them if we have to. All right? I think that's a useful way of thinking about such a system. How does that get back to my earlier discussion? It gets back to it because my original discussion of economies of scale was limited to the first job. My original question was whether rights enforcement has large economies of scale. And I argued that it probably doesn't. I'm not sure I'm right, but I think I probably was right. But we now have to also ask whether threatening other agencies has economies of scale. And the answer on historical basis is sometimes. If you look at international uh, affairs, uh, 
There have been times in history when big countries had a big advantage over small countries, uh, and there have been times when they didn't. And that depends on various details of military technology, depends on how e easy it is for several small countries to ally against a big country, for things like that. So what this suggests is that one has to worry about a, a bit in looking at the kind of system I described as to whether you are going to have the size of agencies pushed up, not because the big agencies can do a better job of rights enforcement, but because they can do a better job of threatening other agencies and thus getting what they want. Now, if, they, if you do, and if my analysis is right, it's probably a temporary problem. That is to say, if you get through the initial stage where those tanks actually have, you know, ammunition in there in them and, and, and gas instead of being museum pieces, uh, if, once you get through that stage, everybody knows that we can change the rules from what they were last year only if both of us agree to. So we've now got a stable default. Now the ability to make threats doesn't matter very much. People who go around threatening other agencies get really unpopular uh, with, the, with all the other agencies and so forth. Uh, so I think the implication is that in whatever process gets you from where we now are to the kind of market anarchy that I'm describing, you do have to be concerned that you might have large economies of scale. You might get large... Uh, enforcement agencies, they might get together and they might reestablish a government. That's a real problem to think about. But on the other hand, if the system is once stable and has been running for a while, now you're back in the dead hand of the past effect where the status quo provides the shelling point and except in extreme circumstances, everybody abides by that and you change the legal system only by consensus, only by, by agreement between the two sides. Uh, so that's the basic story that I'm telling. Uh, this is all stuff that will go into the third edition of Machinery of Freedom when I get around to producing a third edition of Machinery of Freedom. Let me finish by saying that we do have some interesting real-world examples that let you test some of these ideas. And it occurred to me long after I read the book that almost exactly the game that I imagine between my enforcement agencies is being routinely played out in the society you and I live in. Uh, and that's the game between auto insurance companies. That my car runs into your car. We have different, different insurance companies. Same situation as I think you've stolen my television. And we disagree on who's at fault, of course. And the insurance companies, just like the rights enforcement agencies, have two options. One option is violence. Only they call it litigation. That is, one option is the expensive option of going to court, trying to persuade a court that they're in the right. That's costly. The other option is arbitration, some way of staying out of the court system and having some procedure for determining which side pays. It is my understanding, I've made some effort in one talk I gave at GMU to see if I could get one of their graduate students interested in doing some serious research in this industry, which I've never done, but it's my impression that almost no cases go to court that what actually happens is that the auto insurance agencies have established rules among themselves, rules of thumb, basically, which say under these circumstances, we'll agree. We're, we're liable. Under, tho under those circumstances, you'll agree. You're liable. Same rules apply both directions. Of course, once in a while, we'll end up paying for a case that was really your fault. Once in a while, you'll end up paying for a cost that was really our fault. But that's a much better solution than wasting our money uh, suing each other. So that looks to me, if you think about it as a game, not as a piece of history, it's exactly the same game. You've got people who have conflicts which they can settle either by an expensive method in which they insist on getting their own way but may fail to, or by a cheap method which involves agreement between the two, and we seem to observe most of them doing it by agreement. Now, second edition of Machinery of Freedom, I have a chapter on a historical society that I find quite interesting, Saga Period Iceland which had some but not all of these features. It did have a government, but the government had no uh, executive uh, arm, so that there was a court system to settle disputes, but it did not enforce the settlements. The settlements were entirely privately enforced. And I'm currently working on a book on legal systems very different from ours, so I've looked at a whole lot of different historical legal systems. And it's pretty clear that feud systems are one of the fairly common solutions to the problem of having a legal system. And the basic logic of a feud system is that what enforces legal rules is, is the threat of, of private violence. But in well-functioning feud systems, 
which as far as I can tell describes Iceland, describes the traditional Somali system as it originally existed, to some extent still exists, and a fair number of others. In well-functioning feud systems, the violence almost never occurs because there's some way of figuring out who owes whom what, and you then pay blood money or whatever the equivalent in your system uh, instead of having people kill each other. Uh, but so in a way, my system is again a highly organized feud system that what ultimately enforces it is the threat of violence, the fact that if you don't give the television set back, my agency will come after you, uh, but, or at least if you don't agree to go to court and then give it back after the court rules against you. Uh, but what prevents that from being a violent clash between my agency and your agency is that both of them long ago found it prudent to work out ways of deciding who is at fault and to agree we won't defend our customer if the court finds for your guy and you won't go after a customer if the court finds for our guy. So I think that more or less, more or less describes uh, the system. I think that's basically what I wanted to, to say. Uh, I don't know how long we have. Uh, I was told long ago that the one, or concluded long ago, that the one virtue of answering questions over giving a speech is that when you're answering a question, you can be pretty sure that there's at least one person in the audience who is interested in what you're talking about. So I will now switch and turn it over to you people.